Have you ever cried yourself to sleep at night because you didn't understand current liabilities? Well, you are in luck because in this video, you're going to learn what current liabilities are, examples of current liabilities, and how current liabilities are used in financial analysis. And if you hang on until the end of this video, you'll get a special bonus as I'll give you some pickup lines that reference current liabilities. They might come in handy if you're single, looking to meet that special someone, and that special someone is an accountant. So let's start with a basic question. What is a current liability? Well, let's first recall what a liability is. Under US GAAP, a liability is a present obligation of an entity to transfer an economic benefit. IFRS is quite similar, defining a liability as a present obligation of the entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. Thus, under both US GAAP and IFRS, a liability is an obligation to provide some benefit. This could be an obligation to pay cash, to transfer non-cash assets or provide other economic benefits, or to provide services. Now, liabilities can be current or non-current, aka long-term. A current liability is a liability that is due within one year of the balance sheet date or the length of the company's operating cycle, whichever is longer. An alternative definition for a current liability is a liability that is to be satisfied with current assets or by the creation of other current liabilities. Here's an example. Let's say that Walmart purchases shirts from a supplier and agrees to pay for the shirts in 60 days. Walmart would clearly record a liability when it purchases the shirts. This is because Walmart clearly has an obligation to transfer an economic benefit, in this case cash, to the supplier within 60 days. By the way, when a company purchases inventory or services from a supplier on credit, we call this accounts payable. Accounts payable is almost always listed as a current liability, although it's possible for it to be listed as a long-term liability depending on when the money is due. Here are some other accounts you might see listed as current liabilities. You've got notes payable, accrued liabilities, the current portion of long-term debt, collections for third parties such as sales tax payable and payroll related liabilities customer deposits, and unearned revenue. Students often ask, what's the difference between accounts payable and notes payable? And I say, who cares? Just memorize it, or else you'll flunk accounting, become a marketing major, and end up working as an unpaid intern at Walmart. I'm just kidding, I never say that. I have nothing against marketing majors or Walmart, and I'm sure Walmart pays its interns something. The real answer is that notes payable are based on a written promise to pay, whereas accounts payable are not based on a written promise. A note can be secured or unsecured. Secured means specific assets, like inventory or accounts receivable, have been pledged as collateral for the note. For example, let's say you borrowed money from a bank to purchase a Tiger, and the bank made you sign a promissory note. If you pledged your car as collateral, this would be a secured note. Now, when you see notes payable listed as a current liability, it might include things like a bank loan due within the next 12 months, a line of credit with a bank, or commercial paper. Commercial paper is an unsecured note of at least $25,000 with a maturity anywhere from 1 to 270 days. It's a popular form of borrowing because commercial paper usually gets a lower interest rate than a bank loan. This is because commercial paper is usually backed by a line of credit, which makes commercial paper less risky for the lender. Now, it's also common to see accrued liabilities listed as a current liability. Accrued liabilities are a combination of several different liabilities, and they might include things like compensation payable, interest payable, and income taxes payable. Accrued liabilities consist of expenses that have been accrued but not yet paid, and they're typically recorded with an adjusting journal entry at the end of the period. For example, let's take compensation payable. It includes things like salaries, wages, bonuses, vacations, and pensions that have been earned but not yet paid. Do you remember when Clark Griswold's boss agreed to give him a year-end bonus after Cousin Eddie kidnapped him in the movie Christmas Vacation? Well, Clark's boss agreed to give the bonus on December 24th. But what if the company didn't actually pay the bonus to Clark until a few weeks later, on January 15th? If the company's fiscal year end was December 31st and the bonus was $10,000, the company's accountants would have needed to make an adjusting journal entry at the end of the year to record the bonus that had been accrued but not yet paid. This compensation payable would then be listed as a current liability on the balance sheet as of December 31st. Now, every company is different, 
So if you see accrued liabilities listed on the balance sheet, you need to go to the notes to the financial statements to see what's been included. For example, here are the six things that Procter & Gamble included in its accrued liabilities. You can see that Procter & Gamble included some of the things we talked about, such as compensation payable and income taxes payable, as well as some other items. Pretty intense, huh? You might be experiencing chest pain along with lightheadedness and a shortness of breath. Those are just the consequences of learning accounting. But they're also the symptoms of a heart attack. So if you're seriously experiencing those symptoms, seek medical care immediately. For those of you not having a heart attack, hang in there as I have more examples of current liabilities. I mean, you can't die before we discuss the current portion of long-term debt. Long-term obligations such as bonds and leases are typically classified as long-term liabilities. But what if they become payable in the next year? For example, let's say a company raised money by issuing a 10-year bond and it's promised to pay its bondholders $600 million in 10 years when the bond matures. For the first nine years, the bond would be classified as long-term debt. But what about in year 10? In that year, the bond matures and the company has to pay the debt. Thus, in year 10, the bond would be classified as a current liability. This is called the current portion of long-term debt. The current portion of long-term debt also includes debt callable within the next year or the length of the operating cycle, whichever is longer, and debt where the creditor has the right to demand payment due to a loan covenant violation. Now, if we take a look at Colgate Palmolive's balance sheet, you can see that the company reported 14 million of its long-term obligations as a current liability in 2022. But returning to our example, what if the company intends to refinance the bond in year 10 by issuing another 10-year bond? In that case, the company might be able to classify the bond as long-term in year 10, even though the bond is coming due that year. Under U.S. GAAP, obligations due within the next year can be classified as long-term if the company intends to refinance on a long-term basis and the company has demonstrated an ability to refinance on a long-term basis. And the financing must be completed before the date that the financial statements are issued. Under IFRS, on the other hand, the refinancing must be completed before the balance sheet date. Remembering the differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS can be so difficult. It's like trying to film an angry bear while being locked inside a glass box for a Japanese game show. Next, let's discuss deposits and advances from customers. We'll start with refundable deposits. If you've rented an apartment or a house, you've probably been asked to give the landlord a deposit in case you damage the place or break the lease. If you gave the landlord an $800 damage deposit for a three-month lease, the landlord would record the cash received and then record a liability for the refundable deposit. When your lease is up, the landlord would return the cash to you and remove the liability from its balance sheet. Unless, of course, you damage the place, in which case the landlord would keep your deposit, remove the liability, and record revenue. It's fairly obvious why a refundable deposit is a liability, since the company likely has to return the deposit to the customer. But what about an advance payment from a customer? For example, what if you pay $10 up front for a one-month subscription to Spudman magazine? And yes, this is an actual magazine. It's your go-to source for information about the harvesting, care, and storage of potatoes. When Spudman receives that $10, it needs to record a liability. This is really confusing for some people. That's because we usually see customers paying us money as a good thing, but we see liabilities as a bad thing. Someone gave us money and we're recording a liability? It doesn't seem to make any sense. It's like someone laughing at your joke and then slapping you in the face. But when customers pay up front for a product or service, we do indeed record a liability. And that liability is called unearned revenue or deferred revenue. Remember, liabilities don't just consist of obligations to pay money. They also consist of obligations to transfer non-cash assets or to provide services. Thus, if a customer paid in advance for a product, you owe them the product. If a customer paid in advance for legal services, you owe them legal services. If a customer paid in advance for a massage, you owe them a massage. But just a massage, nothing more. I'm sure you run a respectable establishment. Thus, when Spudman receives that $10, it records the cash and a liability because it has not delivered the magazine yet. At the end of the customer's one-month subscription, Spudman could reduce the liability and record revenue, assuming it's provided the magazine as promised. Some companies have a substantial amount of unearned revenue. 
If we take a look at Microsoft's balance sheet, for example, we can see the company had $45 billion of unearned revenue listed among its current liabilities as of June 30th, 2022. Do you know what else creates unearned revenue? When companies sell gift cards. Let's say you truly, deeply care about your brother, so you get him a $1 gift card for Walmart. Walmart would record the cash received and unearned revenue when the gift card is sold. But Walmart can't record revenue until the gift card is redeemed and the product or service is delivered, or the probability of the gift card being redeemed is remote. Let's say your brother uses that gift card to purchase a ring to propose to a significant other. Walmart would then reduce unearned revenue and record sales revenue. It would also have to record cost of goods sold and reduce its inventory account. But what if your brother never used the gift card? This is called breakage. Companies estimate breakage based on historical data for gift card redemptions. They then record a portion of breakage revenue for unredeemed gift cards as other gift cards are redeemed. By the way, breakage revenue can be substantial. For example, breakage revenue accounted for 5% of Starbucks's pre-tax earnings for the fiscal year ended October 2nd, 2022. A labor federation even wrote a letter to the SEC calling for Starbucks to make more extensive disclosures about how it estimates its breakage revenue, as the federation said that Starbucks would not have met its earnings expectations but for the breakage revenue. Starbucks responded by offering a lifetime supply of free coffee to anyone who would stop questioning them about their accounting. I'm just kidding. Starbucks didn't do that to the best of my knowledge. Now, unearned revenue, whether it be from gift cards or other sources, is usually classified as a current liability. However, if the company doesn't believe that that unearned revenue will be earned within the next 12 months or the length of the operating cycle, whichever is longer, it can be classified as a long-term liability. For example, take a look at Tesla's balance sheet as of December 31st, 2022. Tesla has recognized some of its unearned revenue as a current liability and the rest as a long-term liability. Next, let's talk about how current liabilities are used in financial analysis. I mean, why do we even bother to separate current liabilities from long-term liabilities? Well, current liabilities tend to be riskier because the obligation is due sooner. If we're talking about a bond that needs to be repaid in six months versus a bond that needs to be repaid in 20 years, the bond that needs to be repaid in six months is more of an immediate concern because the money is due sooner. Thus, distinguishing between a company's current and long-term liabilities helps us assess a company's short-term liquidity. Investors and creditors want to know whether a company will be able to honor its obligations, particularly those coming due in the next 12 months. This is why investors and creditors use current liabilities to calculate things like net working capital, which is current assets minus current liabilities, and the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities. The higher a company's net working capital and current ratio, the more likely it is the company will be able to honor any obligations that come due in the next 12 months. For example, take a look at the net working capital and current ratios for these two retailers over the same three-year period. Now, one of these retailers had serious problems paying its bills in 2018. Can you guess which one? It was the one with the declining net working capital and current ratio. That company was Sears Holdings, which filed for bankruptcy in October of 2018. Sadly, the good old days where Sears used to sell laudanum and day-old chicks through the mail are long gone. Finally, note that a company's management has an incentive to report liabilities as long-term instead of current. This makes the company appear less risky, and it increases the current ratio and networking capital, which are often referenced in loan covenants. Keep this in mind when you're analyzing a company's balance sheet. Now, I promised you some pickup lines to help you get a date with an accountant, so here we go. Are you a current liability? Because I feel an obligation to get to know you better in the next 12 months. You must be a current liability, because I won't be able to get you out of my mind for the next year. Or you could try a more honest and direct approach, like, I don't know what current liabilities are because I flunked accounting, but I'd really like to hook up with an accounting major. So that's it. I hope you found this video helpful. If you'd like to receive the PDF guide I created to accompany this video, you can sign up for my email list using the link in the description section below. If you'd like to receive the PDF guide immediately, you can join the Edspira YouTube community or become a supporter on Patreon. Whatever you do, please don't DM me asking me to do your homework. That's what ChatGPT is for. Bye-bye.